Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Devo 30 this Wednesday morning, the day before Thanksgiving. It's so good to be back home. Nope. Nope. Not mine. Someone must have left it. It was a long flight from India, but I made it. And I tell you, when I got back, uh, the traffic uh, made me feel like I didn't left India. It was so packed on the way home from LAX to here on the freeway. Just amazing how, how many cars were out there. And I guess they're saying that um, it's 3% more traffic uh, this year than even last year. People uh, leaving back and forth uh, for the holiday season. So, But in India, uh, you think traffic's bad? <laughs> Go to India. It is crazy. It is really crazy. So it's good to be back. Uh, if you want to grab your Bibles, we will be in 1 Corinthians. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> I was able to get about nine hours of sleep after being up for 32 hours in the plane on the way back. It's hard to sleep sitting in a chair and you got two people on the side of you who are trying to sleep also. So you end up just staying up most of the most of the time. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> yeah, all right. I'm not sure if you're there, if anyone's joining us or not. Thank you. Okay, good. I see one person there at least. All right. Well, if you don't mind, we're going to go ahead and pray so that we can get into this morning's study. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. What a beautiful day you've created, Lord. So wonderful to be in your presence, to be among the brethren, to be back home, Lord. Thank you so much, Father, for your grace and for your love for your people, Lord. Whether here in America or, or in India, Lord, um, it's interesting, Father, how your grace <clears throat> is well received in, in either location, Father. And people, people need you, Lord, more than ever before. And Lord, we're, we're approaching this holiday season tomorrow morning, uh, beginning Thursday, Father, to celebrate Thanksgiving. And, and for the secular world, it's, it's a time of family, time to give thanks for all the, the good things, the needs and the, that they have uh, received throughout the year, and also the hopes of continuing to be blessed and prosper. For the Christian Lord, it's, it's more than just thanksgiving for material things, but it's uh, thanksgiving for our salvation, uh, our, our understanding of the gospel message and what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross, that we really do believe it with all our heart. Uh, we accept the, the word of God as God's word. We accept what's in it as truth. Every, every word that's there from Genesis to Revelation, and we also try hard to apply the scriptures to our lives on a daily basis. And it is a anomaly in this day and age, Father, to continue to believe in your word and that you have given us the Bible to live by, uh, especially, Lord, when there's so much opposition to it and uh, criticism. But yet, Lord, you continue to raise up people here in America and even in India and Africa, places where I've been to Uganda, that believe the word of God to be God's word, and they live by it, whether it's here or there, it's the same word, and they they uh, acknowledge it and and live by it uh, exactly as we do here and there. And it's it's so neat, Lord, to see, as I went to India, Lord, that they believe the same thing as I believe here in America, Lord. So your word is awesome, Lord, and I give you thanks for it, and that it's it's a clear message to us all, and we can depend on it, Father, and and apply it to our lives. And so this morning, Lord, I pray you give us understanding. And you let your spirit just minister to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I want to invite you tonight to our Wednesday service at 7 p.m. We will be giving thanks unto the Lord. We will sing and praise the Lord together as a body of Christ and invite you to join us. We will also uh, have a time of thanksgiving as uh, the next day approaches. Uh, Thursday morning at 11 a.m. We will be hosting a lunch in for the community for our neighbors in, in need, our neighbors who have not. 
uh, whether they're uh, homeless or whether they just don't have the funds to to purchase a Thanksgiving dinner, then they are more than welcome to come and join us from 11 to 1 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. And we will serve them with our hearts. We will love them like Jesus loved them. And we will just have a, a neat time of, of fellowship. So you're invited to join us and invite your family members also. So a couple of days of uh, filled uh, joy. Let's uh, go ahead and look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul is speaking concerning his ministry in Christ Jesus here in verses seven, 1 through 7. <clears throat> says, therefore, <clears throat> since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Now, Paul has mentioned this word ministry twice. He talks about uh, the gospel being his ministry. Uh, as believers... In the ministry, we need to understand that Christ is the head of the church. Then Christ gives pastors and teachers and evangelists uh, to govern the church, elders and deacons to help them govern the church. And then you have the body of Christ. That is the roles that God plays and we play in the church. And the church is the pastor's ministry. And Paul said that. Earlier in 1 Corinthians, he said, this is my ministry, and his ministry was to the Gentiles, and he um, cherished that ministry greatly. He put everything that he had into the ministry of the Gentiles, and he loved the Gentile people greatly. And here he reminds us again that since we have this ministry, <clears throat> as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. <clears throat> so apparently, um, it's easy to lose heart. <clears throat> it's easy to get tired. It's easy to get frustrated because we live in a fallen world. Now, tomorrow I suspect that as we gather together to prepare uh, this meal for everyone, that it's going to be a little work, it's going to be a little time-consuming, um, and it's going to be a, a little stretching for us. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> and so this comes along with the, the sacrifice of ministry. And, and Paul understands that ministry is difficult. Uh, he has... Been, I think it was last week that we saw that he had been shipwrecked, persecuted, pressed forward on top of, and all of these various things um, in, in India. And I'll be sharing more with you. Um, <clears throat> some of the uh, persecution that goes on there is, is pretty amazing. So he encourages the believers not to lose heart. <clears throat> there will come an opportunity where you may begin to look at your circumstances and say, it's, it's time to quit. And, and there are many people there. Now, I'm looking at ministry from the perspective of a pastor. I spoke to a pastor friend of mine recently, and he's questioning whether he should continue on you know, in, in the pastorate and ministry because of where he's at and the difficulty that he's having there. And you see this uh, among churches. I think it's a thousand or so churches that are, are closing doors uh, in our nation here every month. And, and pastors losing heart and stopping because the world is getting so secular and so is the church getting secular. Now, some application for those of us that are not necessarily in leadership of ministry, but we're in ministry. Don't lose heart. Ministry is, is difficult. It's hard to find help. It's far, hard to encourage people to get involved because we are in a society, at least here in America, where we're so focused on self. And it's what we can get out of it, what, what we can receive. And, and so you have, to lose, you have to lose self and you have to not lose heart and trust in God that he's going to do a work through you because God is ultimately going to look at your faithfulness and nothing else. So he says, don't lose heart in the ministry. But we have renounced, renowned the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, by, but by manifestation of the truth, condemning, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, least the light of the gospel of glory, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Now, if you remember last time we met, and I know it's been a couple of days, um, I could not get to it on that Thursday night. I was so 
thrashed. The work over there is so much, and they had me doing so much. It's crazy. Traveling just to get to one location for two and a half hours and then getting in there. And their time uh, together usually lasts about two to three hours. They don't just come in for a 45 minute you know, study, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a long time. And, and so I was just thrashed that night. I tried to stay up and then I woke up one time and then I thought, I can't do this. I'm not even thinking straight. So I just, I decided that I was gonna cancel it. And then Monday, my flight was here so I couldn't do it on the airplane. It was just impossible. So I um, thought I'd, I'd just take it up on Wednesday. So the last time we met, we were talking about Moses coming down from the mountain, right? And the veil was over his, his, his face. The, the glory of God was, uh, was dimming. And so he kept that veil over his faith. And, and Paul is saying here that our gospel is not veiled. Uh, our gospel is clearly seen through the scriptures. And, and if we just read the scriptures, we would come to a unity in that gospel. But if it is veiled, he says, the minds of the God of this age. Now he's talking about Satan here, who's the God of this age. And as believers, we believe that there is a force that is against us, and his name is Lucifer. And he does everything he can to hinder the gospel message. He is the one that blinds the eyes of the secular world. Now, if you were to tell that to the secular world, they think you're crazy because there is no devil. And the world has, ha, has done a great job at diminishing his power by displaying him on TV and having holidays that depict uh, Satan. Hi, girls. Oh, my granddaughters are here. One, two, three, four of them. And they're all so beautiful. I miss them so much. Um, they just walked in late, of course, which is expected, right? Because girls are always late, getting their hair, doing their makeup, huh? <laughs> and Lucy, getting her ponytails on. She's so beautiful. Come here, Lucy. Give me a hug, mama. I want you guys to come around this way over here. Come on. Oh, don't be shy. Come give puppy a hug. <laughs> no, now she's shy. She was on her way, but she didn't, didn't do it. So, Okay, so, um, so you know, you, you let the world know that there's this little devil, and they... they do Hollywood, right? A little devil on your shoulder, and he's got this red face and long tail, and so people go, ah, that's the devil, ha, ha, ha. And so they've done a great job at diminishing um, his existence and his authority. But the Bible's clear that he is definitely a created being, an angelic being that had fallen. God had given the, the demonic uh, or the angels free will, and he chose to rebel against God. He wanted to be like God, and that seems to be the problem of our world today, is everyone wants to be God or like God, making their own decisions, leading their own ways instead of submitting to the will of God. And so he rebelled, took a third of the angels with him, and now he's fighting against God by, by deceiving the people of this world uh, to join his team, and yet they don't even know that they're on his team. Uh, and Paul makes it clear that this God, this demon, this uh, angelic, uh, fallen angel, Satan has blinded the eyes of the secular world that they do not believe the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, that it would shine upon them. Now, here's one tool that you can use to remove that blindness, and that's prayer. If you were just to pray to God and, and ask God to remove the blindness from those you love and care about, God promises that he will give them a, 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 a clear opportunity to see and receive the gospel into the heart because every man will stand before God and God is just and we will have that opportunity. And this season, it, it being Thanksgiving and in Christmas coming up, uh, many men will have opportunity to, to see the message of the gospel through the birth of Christ, <clears throat> through the pilgrimage and as they come, came to America to Find a place <clears throat> where they could worship God freely <clears throat> without any real persecution <clears throat> and then spread the gospel to those that were here in America. Um, we'll have that opportunity and you pray. Pray that God will, will remove the veil, veils from their eyes and give them the opportunity to see the gospel. Uh, another tool that we can use, those of you that are, are questioning, you know, is this God real? Is what he said and did real? Um, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, I hear people talking about it, but yet I haven't really done any research myself. And so you can pray and ask God to remove the veil from your eyes and just say, Lord, if you are real, if you have come to this earth and walked among us and gave your life, 
for our sins and then resurrected the third day, then Lord, remove the veils from my eyes that I may see that truth. And then pick up your Bible and, and begin to read it in the Gospel of John. And then read the New Testament several times over and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. And I believe God will reveal himself to you. So that's the way that you combat against the enemy veiling the eyes of this world. So he goes on and says, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves our servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who command, commanded light to shine out of darkness, <clears throat> who has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Important message right there for us is that it's not about us and our message is about the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last night we went to a, a cops and clergy meeting and there were several people there from uh, faith-based uh, ministries which are helps uh, for churches uh, for various things, various religions. And there were probably a handful of pastors there. I, if I were to count them, I think about four four or five at, at the most, and then some uh, assisting pastors, elders, and so forth. But it, it was a neat time of conversation and fellowshipping and, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I like the format and I enjoy the time together. Um, and the objective of that meeting is, is to benefit our community, you know, and, and to reach out and make our community better. I'm all for that completely. But if the message of the gospel is just to make our community a better social place, that's not the message of the gospel. And one brother got it really, really right when he said the church, if it was doing its job, the police would have an easier job. Because if the church were to get out there, preach the gospel message, the true gospel message of Jesus Christ, walking among us, dying, resurrecting from the dead, it would transform people's lives. As it transformed my life, taking me from a hoodlum you know, and place me, placing me in the ministry for God's glory, uh, taking Randy from drugs in a life uh, of destruction and placing him in a place where he's now a productive citizen in the United States, uh, even paying back his debt and in, into to this uh, country of ours. Um, this is what the gospel does. And if, if the gospel truly gets out there, then it would change our community completely 100%. And the police would have less work, right? They would be visiting around, shaking hands and saying hi to everybody more than anything else. And of course, as they said last night, drinking coffee and donuts. Um, <clears throat> but that is the message of the gospel. It's Jesus Christ. He walked among us. He lived among us. And then they crucified him because they hated him. But he resurrected in victory over death itself and given us, us a hope that we too will get to heaven one day. And so this world, and this world is temporal, it's passing. And so what's important is that we live a holy and righteous life in our community, that we be an example of Christ and we preach the gospel. That is the message. And, and I tried to portray that again. I, I don't know if I did a good job because I had just gotten back from India, took two hours sleep and then went to the meeting. So but I try to portray that message again, that, that uh, the gospel message is about Jesus Christ. And, and, and we have a message that, that's very seclusive. So it is very narrow. And it's Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can get to the Father except through him. And I, I made that clear uh, last night also. So Paul is saying you can't veil that anywhere. Anywhere in your life. You really shouldn't try to cover it up. You, you shouldn't try to, to water it down so it's more palatable, right? You don't put sugar in it so it tastes a little bit sweeter and, and so forth. You just share that. And it's sweet enough, by the way. Some people like sugar. And, and they can get sugar tea. And then you watch them get some sweet and low and stuff. And they put even more in your lick. Oh, that's way too much. The gospel is already sugared and it's valuable for us now. So we don't have to water it down. Let's, let's go on. Verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus uh, also may be manifested in our, our body. So you see the persecution that Paul uh, is going through. I mean, he has been suffering quite a bit. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the suffering is, is not what we think here in America. 
I mean, this is real suffering. This, this is, this is, um, this is beatings. I mean, literally taking him and ripping his clothes and, and kicking and hitting and beating him to a pulp where he's almost halfway dead, if not dead. And some suggest that Paul actually did get beaten to death at one point. And that was where he had, it, had his heavenly uh, vision. So he goes on in this, in this uh, <clears throat> trial of his, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. But since we have this same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe that therefore I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. Know this, nor know that he who raised up the Lord Jesus, who also raised us up with Jesus, will and will present us with you, for all things are for your sake, that grace having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. And so the gospel message really is life-giving, isn't it? It's life-changing also. It doesn't leave you in the same place. It didn't leave me in the same place, hopelessness, a place where I thought the only life we have to live is the one that we live down here on this earth, so let's enjoy it. And so you get onto drugs to make yourself feel good, happy and high. Are these kids that are on the street smoking marijuana, going to these dispensaries here in our community of Rupa Valley, uh, they're doing that because they think this is the only life they have. This is the only happiness that they have. And so they smoke their marijuana, they feel good, they walk around high and hungry and eating the munchies and so forth. But it's because their perspective is not correct and they're short-sighted. They don't see the bigger picture. And the gospel comes in place and shows them the bigger picture that God has a plan for their life. They're not evolved from some gobbledygook out of nothing. <laughs> but, but God has a purpose for them to live. And, and so they can live with that purpose and not what the school system has taught them. Uh, um, unfortunately, and I'm totally against, they ought to let Christianity back in there. They ought to bring prayer back in there and preach the, the good news and not the lie of evolution, which destroys our children. And this is why we have such rebelliousness in our world today. And not just ours today and in our society. Back in the 70s, right? The hippie movement. There was a lot of rebelliousness back then during Paul's day. Um, today in India, there's a lot of rebelliousness. You see a lot of these young kids on motorcycles and they're rebellious against uh, society and, and even adults. There's no more respect over there for, for their elders as there once used to be. So the world's changing and the only light in this dark world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul goes on to end, therefore, we do not lose heart. So he's back to what he said in the beginning, don't lose heart. Um, yes, it's tiring and it's difficult, but isn't it rewarding? Isn't it rewarding to see the faces of a young child smiling at you? It was a long trip to India. It was very difficult, very hot and humid there. But when you look at some of the young little faces and they're smiling, you go, wow, Lord. <laughs> and they're surrendering their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you see the elderly, um, they do a lot of kneeling there in their service, the whole service practically, they're kneeling, they're on their knees. And even the 80 year old ladies, and I felt so bad for them. And, and when we were done, one of them tried to, to get up and I ran over there to help her get up. And no, no, everyone else just leaves her alone. This is their culture, this is what they do. And so she'll get up in her time, you know, and it's, it's no big deal to them. Me, I mean, my, my heart went out, I ran over there and I, she grabbed my hand and I'm trying to lift her up off the ground and with all of her, her weight and I go, Lord, this is so well worth it right here to be able to, to see this, uh, someone committed, someone surrendered and willing to, there's no way I could, I could, you know, put my body weight on my legs and knees for 45 to an hour and something minutes there. And yet um, they do this every single time they meet together in prayer and, and so forth. Uh, I don't lose heart because that's what I'm, I'm keeping my eyes on. There's a lot of negative to keep your eyes on. And there are a lot of people that are not faithful, not committed, that fall away. Interesting, even over there, I mentioned it uh, to them. And they go, you mean you guys go through that too? 
and they they were they were saying, "You mean you go through that?" Oh yeah, we get new people here all the time, just constantly different. I'm like, really? So that's the 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 norm for the body of Christ because people are coming and going and and so forth. Don't lose heart. Stay strong. Stay committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe me, your reward's coming. You'll be in heaven, and, and these things will be rewarding. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more excellent, exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So that's our hope and glory, right? Amen? We should be thankful for that this morning, that God has a home preparing a mansion for us that we will be able to live in eternally. Can't compare that to the things that we see upon this earth, not at all. So keep your eyes on Jesus and you won't go wrong. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you'll stay strong. Oh, that actually rhymed. <laughs> That's rare. So keep your eyes on Jesus and he'll keep you in his arms. God bless you guys. I hope you can join us tonight. A time of worship, a time of thanksgiving as we celebrate this Thanksgiving. And then if you'd like to join us to just help us, let us know. Give me a call at 951-681-1092 and I will give you some instructions on how to get here and just help out, whether it's just setting up, serving, cleaning, uh, being available. And also you'll enjoy a meal with us too in fellowship. So it is a community event. And we want you to just spread the word. Let us let them know that Jesus loves them. We love them too. God bless you. And we'll see you on Friday at 9 a.m.